Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 27th. Today, we celebrate the writer inspired by the Oxford Botanic Garden, a place he saw every day. And we'll also learn about medicine with roots in the soil in Indiana. We'll hear a lovely expert about a harbinger of spring, skunk cabbage, simplocarpus phytitis. And we grow that garden library today with a fantastic book about botanical baking with a master baker. Everybody should have a master baker as a friend. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a surprise found in a botanist's garden. But first, I just wanted to invite you to sign up for the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter. This is a fun little email that you can get from me every single Friday. And I try to make it like you're getting a little note from a garden friend. I share what's going on in my garden world. You'll get some garden ideas and garden inspiration that I save up all week long to share with you. And in addition, you'll get a little extra dose of botanical history and botanical literature to get you through the weekend. So just head on over to the website for the show at thedailygardener.org and sign up for the free Friday newsletter today. And then next, I just wanted to remind you that I'm in the middle of my campaign to get 50 reviews for the show on Podchaser. So if you haven't had a chance yet to do that, just head on over to Podchaser, search for the Daily Gardener podcast, and then leave a review for the show. It would mean so much to me. Thank you for helping me reach this goal. And if you do that, I will go ahead and give you a shout out on the show. So stay tuned for that. Here's today's curated article. Today's post was featured in Ag Week, and it was written by Don Kinsler. It was called Predicting the New Year's 2021 Garden Trends. I love the topic of garden trends, especially this time of year when we're all looking forward to the season ahead. Now, Don's post came out at the beginning of the month, but I had so many curated articles that I had to get through that this is the first chance I've had to share Don's post with you. And what I love about Don's writing is that he's very pragmatic, and I think he shared close to 20 trends. So let me give you a little sampling of what Don is predicting for this year, and then you can go ahead and check out the rest of this post for yourself. Don writes, garden period is trending, and not just vegetable gardening, planting colorful flowers for mood boosting, turning shady corners into bright spots, and simple yard beautification will be emphasized in 2021, which is why I say if you're looking for seeds or plants or help in your yard, don't wait. Start sourcing all of that right now. Make phone calls, call your nurseries, call your local landscapers, get it lined up because it's going to be big time in demand this year. And another thing that Don talks about is applying mulches without weed fabric. That's becoming increasingly popular. And my friend Patricia Chandler Newport does this all the time in her landscaping business. In fact, I called her when I was working on a landscape project up at the cabin and I followed her advice. I did not use landscape fabric in some of the new planting beds that I put in up at the cabin. But the key here is to apply your mulch thick enough or you're going to have a huge mess on your hands. Now, Don says that mulch must be at least five inches thick for optimum weed control. If you're not going to put down a landscape fabric or some type of fabric barrier, and I know Patricia agrees with that. And the other thing that Patricia and I talk about all the time is that mulch needs to be replenished every single year. You've got to top dress those beds. You've got to add more because it breaks down over time. 
You know, the best day that you will ever have in terms of the perfect amount of mulch in your garden bed is the day you just add the mulch because the minute you add it, it starts to break down. That's just nature doing her thing. So I know that's hard to hear for some people because mulch can be expensive. It's laborious to spread around. I know my husband is always asking me, why do we have all these bags of mulch? He's an engineer, so he sees things very linearly, and he wants to get to the end of the mulching project. But as gardeners, this is a never-ending task for us. So if you're going to jump on board this trend of not using landscape fabric, which I think is a great idea, you absolutely have to mulch, and you have to mulch thickly. Finally, the other tip, and and again, this is just one of many, lots and lots that Don has that I wanted to share with you is this one. He says, on-site water collection will become more essential in areas that are drought stricken, rain barrels, and water collecting gardens can sustain plants when outdoor watering is restricted. You know, this is exactly spot on. My neighbor at the cabin does this quite a bit. He's got huge rain barrels to collect the water. And I predict that this will be something that becomes more and more universal as time goes on because water is a precious and expensive commodity. And learning how to collect and manage the water that falls on your property is going to be a top priority. That'll be in vogue not only this year, but in all the years to come. No doubt about it. All right. Now, if you would like to read Don's article for yourself, just search for the word trend in the Facebook group for the show and Don's post will pop right up. And you might also see the other two garden trend articles that I sourced for you this month. But you know what? They're all good. So go ahead and read through them all. You won't regret it. And it will totally get you in the mood for gardening this season. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group, don't sweat it. It is so easy to join this group. All you need to do the next time you're on Facebook is head on up to the search bar, type in Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the English mathematician and writer Charles Dodgson, also known as Lewis Carroll, who was born on this day, January 27th in 1832. Lewis had worked as a librarian at Christ Church College in Oxford. His office window had a view of the dean's garden, and Lewis wrote in his diary on the 25th of April in 1856 that he had visited the deanery garden where he was planning to take pictures of the cathedral. Instead, he ended up taking pictures of the children in the garden. Children were allowed in the deanery garden, but not in the cathedral garden, which was connected to the deanery garden by a little door. And so the Oxford Botanic Garden inspired Lewis Carroll to write Alice in Wonderland. And it was this very same garden that also inspired the authors J.R.R. Tolkien and Philip Pullman. And in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, there is one of the sweetest passages for gardeners. It goes like this. In most gardens, the tiger lily said, they make the beds too soft so that the flowers are always asleep. And it was on this day, January 27th in 1950, that Science Magazine announced a brand new antibiotic made by Charles Pfizer and Company, and it was called Teramycin. 
You know, I have to chuckle as I share this brevity with you today, because last year when I shared this particular item, I don't think many of us were as familiar with the word Pfizer as we are today living through the COVID-19 pandemic. But anyway, back in the 1950s, Pfizer was a small chemical company based in Brooklyn, New York. And it turns out that Pfizer had developed an expertise in fermentation with citric acid, and this process allowed them to mass produce drugs. When Pfizer scientists discovered an antibiotic in a soil sample from Indiana, their deep tank fermentation method allowed them to mass produce teramycin. Pfizer had been searching through soil samples from around the world, isolating bacteria-fighting organisms when they stumbled on teramycin. Effective against pneumonia, dysentery, and other infections, teramycin was approved by the USDA. And the word teramycin is created from two Latin words, terra for earth and mycin, which means fungus, thus earth fungus. And teramycin made history. It was the very first mass-marketed product by a pharmaceutical company. Pfizer spent twice as much marketing teramycin as it did on R&D for teramycin. And the gamble paid off. Teramycin, earth fungus, is what made Pfizer a pharmaceutical powerhouse. And so there's the through line from the vaccine we're using today all the way back to that bacteria in the soil from Indiana that helped make teramycin. In unearthed words, today's words are about the first flower of winter, as written about in the book Hedge Maids and Fairy Candles, one of my favorite books of all time, and it was written by Jack Sanders, the great garden author. In much of North America, skunk cabbage has earned the widespread reputation as the first flower of spring. It might be more accurate, however, to call it the first flower of winter. The naturalist John Burroughs said, The skunk cabbage may be found with its round green spear point an inch or two above the mold in December. It's ready to welcome and make the most of the first fitful March warmth. Henry David Thoreau observed that new buds will begin pushing upward almost as soon as the leaves wither and die in the fall. In fact, he counseled those afflicted with the melancholy of late autumn to go to the swamps and see the brave spears of skunk cabbage buds already advanced toward the new year. People living in colder parts of North America have long watched for skunk cabbage as a sign of spring. The tip of the plant's spathe or sheath begins to push through the still frosty earth and to stand tall when the first faint breaths of warmer air begin blowing. This process can occur in January with an unusually long January thaw a goose haw, as some New Englanders call it, or it can happen as late as March. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Botanical Baking by Juliet Sear. This book came out in 2019, and the subtitle is Contemporary Baking and Cake Decorating with Edible Flowers and Herbs. In this book, celebrity baker Julia teaches us how to make and decorate the most beautiful botanical cakes using edible flowers and herbs to decorate your cakes and bakes. 
After working in the baking industry for two decades, Julia knows what flowers are edible and what flowers have great flavor. She also shares everything you need to do to work with edible flowers, how to use, preserve, store, and apply them, including pressing, drying, and crystallizing flowers and petals. Julia shares 20 botanical cakes that feature edible flowers and herbs, and her creations include a confetti cake, a wreath cake, a gin and tonic cake, yes please, a floral chocolate bark, a naked cake, a jelly cake, a letter cake, and more. Known in England for her beautiful bloom-covered cakes, Julia counts royalty and celebrities among her many clients, and I can see why. This book is 144 pages of beautiful botanical baking with edible flowers and herbs. And you can get a copy of Botanical Baking by Juliet Sear and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $13. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, January 27th, in 1994, that the South Bend Tribune out of South Bend, Indiana, shared an article by Doug Glass called Botanist Finds Endangered Plant in His Garden. For someone who makes his living studying plants, George Itskevich is an indifferent gardener. It took him several months to notice that a load of topsoil delivered to his home in St. Louis was sprouting several clusters of Trifolium stoloniferum, also known as running buffalo clover. This native plant had all but vanished in Missouri. George said, I was out weeding a flower bed near this topsoil, down on my knees, when I sort of came nose to nose with these things. And get this, George works at the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. He said, you spend all this time and effort looking for this in nature. The discovery was so unexpected. And the article ended this way. Now, some five years after his discovery, the Missouri Department of Conservation oversees some 700 seedlings in 25 experimental plots statewide. Isn't that a great story? So keep your eye peeled for rare plants in your topsoil. You never know, you just might run into your own little cluster of running buffalo clover. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thus, Earth Funka. <laughs> oh my gosh. This book came out in 2019, and the subtitle is... Con-
This book came out in 2019, and the subtitle is Contemporary Baking and Cake Decorating. Contemporary Baking and Cake Decorating with Edible Flowers and Herbs. For someone who makes his living studying plants, George, oh my gosh, Yatskevich, Yatskevich. Yatskevich. Yitzkevich. Yitzkevich. George Yitzkevich. George Yitzkevich. 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 George Yitzkevich. 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 George Yitzkevich. 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 For someone who makes his living studying plants, George Yitzkevich is an indifferent gardener.